Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Greg. And thank you to the hosts uh, and organizers, Catherine and Phil, um, especially. So we'll hope that I can um, easily uh, share my screen when I need to, um, but I'm not sure that I see um, that I can do that here. So just give me a sec to um, be able to share the screen because it's the possibility is not. Ah, there we go. Okay, good enough. So um, let me begin with a question, a sort of facetious question, but I'll, I'll begin. Um, can we dance with the Stoics? Um, really, uh, does the art form capture key Stoic notions about how to flourish? Uh, in the pursuit of virtue. Would the ancients have the slightest interest? And now I'm thinking about partner dance, in partner dance. Um, um, you know, Zeno might have attracted large crowds, the painted colonnade, the Stopoikile, but would he attract a dance audience? <laughs> Boleto maniacs. Um, and we know Epictetus had a lame foot. Um, Marcus, in the time of the um, uh, um, campaign, uh, along the Danube that I'll speak about shortly um, was um, suffering from Antonine plague. So he wouldn't have been up for dancing. So, um, and it wasn't fitting for an emperor really to do the kind of mime dance. But what I'm really musing about is not, can they dance? Um, or would they in principle be interested in dance? What would interest them in principle about that? Um, you know, what would be in uh, interest them in the idea of following your step, catching your tempo, swaying with your sway? Uh, would they get the idea, um, not so much the know-how, but the know that, as we say, of what's at stake in mirroring your steps without colliding into you or marching in formation? Um, since uh, in the ancient world and in our world too, the, the military parade is this kind of form of dance um, or keeping the right distance so no one trips. Um, you know, would they have philosophical interest in the idea of dancing in time with the Kithra, Nero's famous fiddle or Pan's flute? We were just talking about um, imaginary creatures um, or uh, figures in literature. Um, uh, epics as told on stage or the like. So music and dance that follows the ancient modes, um, Dorian, Lydian, Phrygian, um, if you're readers of Aristotle and Plato, um, was sort of like major and minor modes, have always had a time-honored place in ancient moral education. Uh, Aristotle tells us through the rhythm of dance figures, uh, we can imitate character emotion and actions. And I take this up a bit in um, my early book, Fabric of Character. Plato's a little worried about uh, getting the wrong ideas through um, music and dance. And so he has some sen uh, censorship well known. But nonetheless, um, dance was venerated in the ancient world, um, even if it had to be controlled. So, but is there something special in particular about partner dance that captures Stoic philosophical ideas. And I, I think there is, and that has to do with social connection, connecting with others through their steps. Um, and partner dance especially emphasizes that social connectivity. But that image, you know, just briefly of social connection and its importance as symbolized uh, for the purposes of today in my talk in, in dance, partner dance, flies in the face of a popular gloss on ancient stoicism um, that many um, that many really celebrate. And that is that uh, stoicism is about tough individual grit. You retreat to the inner citadel and you use meditative exercises to minimize the impact of the exter exterior world. Um, so of course we anticipate tragic loss through these meditative exercises. Um, we manage fear and grief that might come to us from our vulnerabilities so that all of these um, assaults don't uh, unravel us, you might say. So if that's the case, um, what would you want to do with leaping onto a dance floor into 
you know, Mar Margot Vafontaine into Nureyev's arms, you know, he might not be ready to catch you at that very moment. That's putting your faith in someone else's um, hands. Um, it's not retreating to the inner citadel by any means. So if we think of stoicism as strengthened by the self, inner self, and, and by minimizing the impact of others, um, then how do we really uh, deal with dance? Um, I want to argue that the Stoics really do have a notion of Stoic social, of social grit, you might say. Um, and I talk about that a bit in Stoic Wisdom. Um, and we can gl glimpse it one view of that social self strengthen through connection again in dance. Children play by dancing with others. It's an early form of social bonding. Adults play by dancing with others. It's a um, form of uh, bonding throughout life. I danced with my mother when she was 97. She in a wheelchair, I in a, um, you know, twirling her around, making sure that we didn't, um, I didn't do it too fast. But, um, you know, we were mindful that we were really connecting. It was a farewell dance, it, um, but we did it together locked in step. So as the ancients knew, that kind of connectivity finds its home um, not only in dancing on stage or on a village threshing floor uh, in some festival to the gods, it's key to the cadences of military march as well. Um, that's stepping in time to a rhythm. Um, parade drills and military processions go hand in hand. In the Greek world, um, in the ancient Greek world, um, the young soldiers, the Ephebes, uh, were soldiers during one season on stage and choruses, and then, excuse me, they were choristers in one season, and then they would move to the campaign, to the rural uh, areas outside of the urban areas to take up battle. So they switched a helmet uh, that was from the campaign to a kind of mask, but they moved back and forth. So, and that connection, uh, it, it was maintained even in this, uh, you know, in the um, 17th century, Louis the 14th was a consummate ballet dancer, and he would send his ballet master out to the fields, to the parade grounds, in order to train his troops. So uh, let's see if I can um, share my screen for a half sec. Um, I'm hoping you see it. Greg, we good? Yeah. Um, good. Okay. Um, so, well, that's, of course, Matisse showing you the connectivity of dancers, Modern Museum of Modern Art. Um, in New York. Um, but there's Louis XIV, dancer as he was. And here's the idea of connecting. That's Swan Lake. Um, look, you know, it's one body connecting. Um, this looks like the uh, peacock images some of you have as your backdrops. Um, amazing. That's Swan Lake. One, one body, a cadre, a core, a corps de ballet, a body of ballet. And there's there again, it looks like one body in synchrony connecting with one another. And a parade ground, very similar. This is West Point in the United States. Um, but here is Balanchine doing it for the Union Jack. And here is Balanchine doing it, George Balanchine doing it for Stars and Stripes. Um, okay, let's see now if I can stop the share for a half sec. Okay, there we go. So um, for Louis the Fourteenth, it wasn't just to train troops. His, his notion was, he said, it's most advantageous for nobility to know how to um, um, move um, in the right status and rank, but also once you're out in the battlefield. And, you know, of course, I had, I doubt that Marcus Aurelius was ever reading, um, or excuse me, that Louis XIV was reading Marcus <laughs> Aurelius. Maybe he was, but listen to the meditations. He's He's jotting down from the battlefield thoughts, and he says, um, we have to think about um, bodies in mutually intertwined movements and ordered re arrangements. We've been speaking about cosmos, the order of the cosmos, um, a kind of cosmic choreography. And he says, bodies in alignment are like fellow workers in what comes to pass in the world. And he says, we sometimes move like sleepers, unconscious and blind, but with a little training, we can um, mirror each other and coordinate our movements. And um, so uh, now, 
you might say we sort of create a group movement. Mirror and your, um, I've studied a little bit of this, but I'm no expert by any means, but um, mirror neurons, which I don't fully believe in as uh, genetic or um, um, nonetheless seem to certain of the same neurons may fire in our brains, macaque monkey brains, when we observe someone doing what we can do and when we observe it in simple movements like pincer movements um, and the like. So if I have it in my repertoire, in a certain way, seeing is doing, the same neurons may, um, may fire. And, you know, I suspect Marcus was thinking a little bit along these lines when he was uh, setting up or Roman soldiers would march 30 to 40 kilometers in a given day and they would mark their steps to a rhythm of right, left, right, left, uh, dex sin, dex sin, dexter sinister in Latin. And they would um, sing to cadences in order to connect with each other. So Marcus is thinking of, I think, these the synchronies in bodies. And at the break of, you know, on a sleepless night, he himself a kind of sleepless worker. He had, so many of you know, he had trouble sleeping um, when he was in battle. He wrote that if we don't connect with each other, we're like a dismembered hand or foot, a head hacked off, lying somewhere else from the body in um, meditation seven. And so um, we need to, he says, work together. That's how we're born. We were born to work together like feet or hands or eyelids. He has body parts a lot, um, like the rose. He must have had a good orthodontist because he talks about the rose <laughs> of upper and lower tree teeth, you know, working well together. Um, so um, this is a kind of synchrony of movement, um, whether you're on the battlefield or on a dance floor. Um, with this in mind, uh, I want to just briefly, with a little aside, um, turn to someone who captured the synchrony on the battlefield better than anyone I know. And it's the World War I epic poet, um, London and Welsh, David Jones, hailed by T.S. Eliot as one of the greatest poets of his era. And he was himself a Welsh fusilier, and he writes an amazing epic poem to my mind, parentheses, um, about the Battle of the Somme, toward the uh, Somme, uh, which was a horrible, as Robert Graves says, balls up essentially of massacre. Um, but uh, this is how this fusilier himself writes. He was also an artist. He was uh, did a remarkable artwork as well, plastic painting, plastic arts. Feet plodding in each other's unseen tread, so close to blunder, toe by heel tripping, file mates, blind on following, just like Marcus's blind workers, um, moving with a singular identity, feet following file friends. So in this march, the cues come not from a drum or a pipe, because that would be a cue to the um, to the Germans, but from the from from the step on the stone or the Burberry, he says, interlined Burberry. These are the, the trench coats, damp flapping across knee joint, pop, 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 like a metronome almost. Um, and so it's the subtle mechanics of bonding in March, muscle bonding, some say, of the body knowing what the mind doesn't. Um, and he gives us this sense, I think that Marcus was talking about of, of sleepwalkers in synchrony, uh, working almost as one. So are there other ancient images that depict the synchrony of bodies in motion that are at once dance-like in a part of a theater of war? And um, there are, um, and I don't know if Marcus would have known of these, uh, but uh, here's one, for example. Are we there? Can you see that? Is it? Is it up? Not yet. Not yet. There you go. Okay, there we go. Um, so there we have it. Uh, it's the excuse me. I don't want to lose something here. Um, it's the um, it's the neo. It, it's from Azur Panapal, the ruler neo Syrian. Many of you probably know this from the British Museum. Um, there's also one of these at Yale, uh, British Gallery. 
and other places, I presume. And it's we a lost the share there, Nancy. Yeah, we're not seeing you yet. Oh, you're not seeing it? Hold on. Nope. How is that to be the case? One minute. Share screen. Are we seeing it now? Yes. Yes? We got it. Uh, Greg, say yes or no. Yeah, we got it, Nancy. Okay, super. So what you've got there is these um, dancers in a kind of, uh, warriors in a kind of phalanx moving forward. Um, and they're all in a line. And I have to now just sort of give you a sense here of, there they are again, angular flat warrior movements. And here, this is Martha Graham. She studied Greek philosophy, uh, the Greek movements, Assyrian movements, as did her, um, her, her um, uh, Ted Sean and um, Saint Denis, Ruth Saint Denis, Isadora Duncan. They all were very moved by early imagery. That's um, Doris Humphrey. It's all very sideway tilts, um, a little like those Assyrian dancers. This is Martha Graham steps in the street commemorating the Spanish Civil War where a lot of British and American um, lefty kind of soldiers went to fight against fascism. Um, there it is again. That's very Assyrian, that movement of the side bodies. Uh, she was studying these imageries, so it's quite remarkable. So let me stop share for a half sec and then try to share one more time. So there you have dance um, imitating uh, the battlefield imagery. Um, now, what about Seneca? He's simply brilliant on the idea of partner dance, but his notion is partnering as in the game of catch because he uh, thinks of that simple games were often forms of dance as children sort of sort of knew ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, that kind of stuff. They're dancing in circle dances, but they're playing at the same time. And in his case, um, he's thinking of it, the game of catch as requiring mutual attunement, a synchrony with your partner. And this is Seneca on benefits. Greg was just telling us about on benefits book two, sometimes translated on favors, de beneficis. I would like to take up the analogy uh, regarding gift giving, which our own Chrysippus drew with a game of ball. It falls to the ground through the fault of either the person throwing it or the person receiving it. Um, while it remains in play only by being properly passed and thrown from one and caught to the other pa a pair of hands. A good player needs to send it off differently to a tall partner than to a short one, just like dancers need to know how tall or short their partners are if you're going to partner them well on a dance floor or catch them in a leap. Um, again, if the game is with a trained and practiced player, we'll should be, we shall be bolder in throwing the ball. No matter how it comes, his hand will be ready to drive it back. Against an untrained novice, we shall not throw it so hard or so vigorously, but be more relaxed, aiming the ball right into his hands and simply meeting it when it comes back. No pitcher would do this <laughs> in a baseball field. Um, we should use the same procedure doing favors. So Seneca tells us we should know how to give gifts, how to be generous to others so that we're attuned to their needs. He says, never give, um, never give a country bumpkin a, a, a stack of books, never give someone in the summer a hot, a heavy winter coat, know your audience, know how to give a gift. Um, and he says, it's like the fluid notion of the three graces. A gift, Seneca says, following Chrysippus, is characterized by three gestures, the giving, the receiving, and the returning. It's a dance of reciprocity that flows back on itself seamlessly from person to person. They hold hands on a dance that goes back on itself. And let's see if I can share the screen one last time. Um, there you have that. But that's the dance of Apollo with the muses. They're dancing back and forth um, in catching each other's hands, you might say, um, very much like Matisse's uh, dance, dancers, la dance um, there. Um, let's stop share. So 
there you have this game of uh, uh, game of catch, dances of the graces, um, benefactions back and forth, all requiring coordination, a certain amount of synchrony. And it's meant to be a model not just for giving favors, for generosity, uh, essentially, we would say, or goodwill, as um, um, Greg, I think, mentioned earlier, um, but for how to listen and respond. Good teachers do this all of the time. You know, um, you know how to keep up a back and forth dialogue and who you're talking to, graduate students, undergraduates, um, partners, et cetera, et cetera. So partnering is hard. It's hard enough on the dance floor. <laughs> it's hard when you move outside familiar patterns. Um, um, just as when we you know, you dance with people you don't know how to dance with. We don't always dance together well, like a Fontaine and a Nureyev. Most partnerships are not like a game of catch, even if the players are matched in skill. So really in asking what can the Stoics teach us through their metaphor of partnered dance or partnered synchronous movements, I'm not really saying we should turn to them because they have promising answers to the most pressing questions of this week and last week about global peace and cooperative living in regions that have not known that, that would be the height of folly. What I'm really asking is, um, is this, uh, is that what I'm really saying is it's stoic interest in the cosmic global orderly choreography of coordinated movements runs deep and wide if you apply it and is integral to their understanding of our social natures, of how we connect and try to follow each other's moves without imposing our own um, in picking up another's cues in body language, in voice, in tempo, the like. So to try to move in step, at least some of the time, is a way to quote Seneca at the end of On Anger, a way to cultivate our humanity. Thank you very much. Hope I have time for a few questions. All right. Well, let's see what people bring in. But there's already a, a good comment that I think could be turned into a very interesting question because I, I know partly what your answer is to this. So JB wrote, as an aside, a Stoicon on the theme of Stoicism and play would be amazing. And that, that might be the case, but you have a project on play. Do you want to say something about that? Well, yeah, I have a project on play. I'm not quite sure where it will go, but I think the ancients are often thinking about seriousness. Um, uh, Spudias, the sort of, you have to be serious and play is respite. Uh, John Stuart Mill kind of picked that up, uh, you know, light, light pleasures, the, the low water ones are good for recreation. But, you know, if you really want to work hard, you know, it's leisure, but it's just a respite from other things. And and so play often gets a, a, a bad, you know, a, a bad press by the ancients. But it would be hard to imagine a work without play, a, a world without play, pardon me, um, work without play, um, love without play, scholarship without play, um, a break from seriousness. We need to have fun um, and healthy play. And children are amazing at it. And we should all, you know, some play with cats, but I, I play with grandkids and they are pretty cool. And <laughs> I used to play with my children. There you and my husband's very playful. So find yourself a partner who is really playful. Here's a question. So this is from Heath. Uh, would you describe dancing metaphorically as a way to integrate yourself properly into society as a whole? I don't really know how to think about that. That's a hard question. Um, I was thinking of, you know, I've danced much of my life. I've done a lot of modern dance. So that was my interest. And I once had a fellowship thinking about dance. And I was, it was really about um, partnering and synchrony and moving in time with others. And dance is sort of a limited way of thinking about it. But it's so, the social dance, at least not solo dancing, 
Um, but, if, but, you know, it so requires um, uh, moving with others. So, you know, um, and as I say, I don't think the Stoics, well, Seneca takes it up pretty directly in that last quote. And there's certainly material in Cicero, which I didn't have time to give you today, about the grace and alignment of bodies is imitated or is representing virtue. Um, that's his that's his idea. So not a not a um, hard question. I'm not sure how to can, fill can it we, out. Can we extend this from the physical into other interpersonal matters? Like you know, you think about being on a good good team in a workplace, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, partnerships. You know, it's about partnerships, teamwork. Um, no, uh, in philosophy, we sometimes talk about some people in philosophy language talk about uptake. Um, how do you communicate in performative moments with the right uptake? Um, and it's very much upon you to do that, uh, to give the cues to another. You know, we would say colloquially, know your audience. Diplomats mm. have to do this all the time. Um, very hard job. So, um, yeah, there's lots of ways in which dance as partnership, social partnership as connecting, knowing how to connect um, and um, be in sync, um, read someone else's cues, read their emotions, read their body language, read their eyebrows, read their gestures, their voice, inflection. All of that is sort of um, part of our work as interlocutors. Um, and it's part of our work in doing moral philosophy, really, that has practical application, where whether it's a small group or a larger group. So here's one that calls for a little bit of speculation. And I think this will probably be our last question. Please. This is from Eric. Do you think the fact that group dances, for example, Jewish or Scottish dances are becoming less popular than partnered or solo dances says something about the world we live in now? <laughs> That's a hard question. I don't know. Um, yes. Well, Morris dancing, if that's, if that, I mean, Welsh, I think it's Welsh actually, um, you know, is, is one form, Israel, Israeli dancing is a folk dance. Um, I'm not far in um, Bethesda from, Bethesda, Maryland, from Glen Echo that does lots of group dancing regularly. And people, I mean, I can't tango for the life of me. It's one of the hardest art forms to me. Um, but yeah, that is partnered dance. Good question. Um, not not group dance, um, but lots of people sort of think about kids who go to events. Mm. They're kind of on the floor, mash, you know, mushing about, or they're you know they're at a concert and they're you know they're doing a wave. That's pretty group. That's big group time. It's not a yeah. dance, is you know, it's dance with your hands. Well, let's all thank Nancy uh, in whatever form you want to use. Uh, great talk and uh, everything I'd expected. Thank you, Greg. Very, very kind. <laughs>